I think we have an almost full room for this talk, so we can begin a minute earlier. So we now have Nena Ndukwe. Indeed. Sorry, yeah. did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, from Slim AI, and she's going to discuss security best practices for production-ready containers, but also I just wanted to quickly ask Nena to also talk about Slim AI a little bit if she wants to. Yeah, that, that'll and be cover that. Okay. okay, perfect. Okay. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, so... I okay. Let's begin. All right. Take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Nana Ndukwe, and I am a developer advocate at Slim AI. Um, so today I'll be sharing about sharing five practical examples of how you can get your containers more secure to be ready for production. So I'll briefly introduce Slim AI, and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So Slim AI was created to give developers the power to build safer, cloud-native applications with less friction, and complementary to our open source project known as Slim Toolkit, we have the Slim Developer Platform, and that allows developers to optimize their containers and get them more secure and ready for production. So by increasing the efficiency of your DevOps workflow and decreasing the attack surface, the whole point of Slim AI is to ensure that you're only shipping what you need to production. I do want to say, uh, to be honest, I am super nervous. And the reason is, is because I have not spoken at a conference since the pandemic, pre-pandemic. So if you see me being nervous, just understand that I'm a little you know, rusty with this. But what I'm talking about is coming from the heart. So um, I'm going to continue now. So the whole point of Slim AI is uh, to automate the process of shipping lightweight, secure, and optimized containers. And I'm going to go through um, the different tools that we have to do that. So, but a little bit of a background on myself. Um, I am a software engineer, and I made a career transition, a pivot into developer advocacy recently. And uh, now I'm in the cloud native space. I was in other um, industries before, so cloud native is super new to me and a little bit overwhelming, and I've been learning as much as I can about it. I've also noticed that there's this influx of uh, developers who are super interested in DevOps and DevSecOps, which I think is pretty cool because I'm a part of that crowd too. And I feel like we need as many resources or access to resources to level up on those skills. Um, coming from the developer world, I would say I didn't have to interact too much with uh, containers directly. That was something that DevOps engineers had to do. But we were shipping containers to production. Um, so I've been documenting my journey about learning about containers, and I realized that there was this really huge opportunity as a developer getting into developer advocacy to learn about the experience of DevOps engineers and the pain points in their workflow. And I didn't realize until recently learning about some statistics from the chief data scientist here at Slim AI that most DevOps engineers or developers were... Um, when they were hardening their containers or slimming their containers, they were doing it manually. And that blew my mind because I came into this space joining Slim AI where we're all about automating containers. So um, apps that are built by developers these days are wrapped in containers and they're shipped to production, but one can hypothesize if there are gaps between the understanding of knowledge of developers and uh, DevOps engineers' specializations, um, it's important that we focus on improving our container security knowledge as developers. When we do that, then we can empower ourselves to be able to build better things that are safer. So where does one begin if you want to learn the fundamentals about container security and how to optimize your containers? I feel like whether you're an expert or a beginner, it's good to take a step back and to look at the building blocks of container security optimization. And we'll be able to do that uh, going through this, looking at seeing how we can leverage um, Slim tools. So first we're going to break down a basic Python Flask application. We're going to look at the sample application and see how we can improve it by taking a look at um, the Docker file. And uh, we want to know exactly what we're shipping to production. So we're going to scan those containers. And then we are going to analyze them and see what kind of vulnerabilities they have, what is the image sizes, and we're going to pick out of four uh, Python-based images, which one would be the best one to build this Flask app. And then after that, we'll harden the container image using Slim Toolkit, and this is all about reducing the attack surface. So 
the idea is we'll start with one of the Python-based images, the official image, which is 932 megabytes, is quite a bit, relatively, and over 1,000 vulnerabilities. And we're going to reduce that to 25 megabytes with zero vulnerabilities. I'm going to show you how we go through that process. So one of the things to first look at is um, how to improve your Docker file. And that's a really huge part of container security improvement. Um, when we use this basic Python example, it's a very simple Flask app and it implements a RESTful API. Um, since this app needs to run, uh, it needs Python in order to run, we're going to look at the four different base images and then determine which one is the most lightweight and most secure. So now we're reviewing the Docker file of the official Python uh, base image. And uh, we see that it is using uh, an official base image and a work directory that's defined, which is good. It has good layer construction and minimize cache and validation, and it optimizes uh, build performance. The files are copied in only as required, and we are exposing a port, and also we're using entry point, which is good for proper signal handling. But there's a few other things to think about when it comes to um, security, from a security perspective with constructing your Docker file. So one of the things that you want to do is avoid running your internet-facing app as root. Um, nobody is an unprivileged system account, and it's available by default in Debian, Ubuntu, Alpine, Distroless. And this is intended to run when you don't need any special permissions. It's usually reserved for services um, so that if they get compromised, the potential attacker would have minimal access to the rest of the system. And running your app as root obviously allows the potential hacker to have complete access to your container. When you are constructing this Docker file, it's good to choose a version number of your base image and um, pin it, which is what we call pinning. Um, there are some tutorials out there that teach people who are newer to this space to uh, use the latest image tag. Um, but I feel that containers are meant to be created and destroyed. You should be able to start them and stop them. And they should be re reproducible with um, ease and reliability. So using the latest tag is probably not the best case in this situation, since it isn't a single source of truth uh, for the container's bill of materials. Uh, a new revision to the latest tag could introduce some major version bumps, and there might be some uh, bugs or introduce some breaking changes into your app if you are always relying on the latest tag when changes are occurring and you're not aware of it. But if you pin a specific major or minor version in your Docker file, there, are, there is a trade-off for sure. Um, you're choosing to not automatically um, receive system updates or language updates or upgrades. But most of the DevSecOps teams prefer to uh, employ security scanning, and that is a way to control the updates so that we don't have to deal with like, the unpredictability of um, some runtime failures or container building issues. So the next slide we're going to talk about, or sh I'll show you how uh, pinning can be helpful in this case. Um, when some people say to avoid update commands in a Docker file, um, I know that a lot of people in this space are a lot of container experts have debates about how you should properly, what a really good Docker file looks like. Um, we could probably discuss that after this. But uh, when you don't pin a specific base image and you don't have these update and upgrade commands in your Docker file, then you know, whatever the latest base image is won't be maintained necessarily. So um, whether that image is maintained by large companies or by someone who has a side open source project, um, it would be their responsibility to go back to it and manually get it updated. And that can easily fall behind the versions of the, uh, the versions that are used by other packages in that uh, app repo. So when you pin a stable base image, then you can leverage the apt get packages and upgrade update commands in your Docker file, and they will automatically handle security fixes and uh, bug, severe bug fixes. Uh, you can safely apply the system updates, and you won't have to really worry about any breaking changes. But you need to make sure that you're really applying the uh, latest updates. And we're going to talk about layer caching. So as some of you might know, Docker builds can be kind of slow. Um, and we use layer caching. And this is to reuse build steps that have already happened in order to speed up the current one. 
While this does improve bill performance, there is potential downside, and that's something that is talked about sometimes, but caching can lead to insecure images. So for most Docker file commands, if the text of the command hasn't changed, the previously cached layer will be reused and in the current build. So when you're relying on caching, um, the, those apt-get commands will add old and potentially insecure packages into your images. So you can do that. You can, something you can do is you can bypass the caching by using a pull and dash s pull and dash s no cache um, uh, command options. And the pull is going to pull the latest version of the Docker base uh, image and instead of the locally cached one. And then also the no caching will ensure that the additional layers in the Docker file get rebuilt from scratch instead of relying on the layer cache. Um, if you add those arguments to the Docker build command for the new image, it will have the latest system level packages and security updates. And if you want the benefits of caching and to get the security updates within a reasonable amount of time, what you would do is first you would use the normal build process for when you want to release um, new code. And then the second is every night you would rebuild your container image uh, from scratch using Docker build pull no cache. And that will ensure you that you have your security updates. But now that we've gone over that, we're going to talk about what is going on inside of containers. So what we want to do is to be able to scan our container to know what's inside of it. And one of the ways you can do that is by leveraging Docker commands. And um, this goes through the vulnerability scanning, and it generates SBOMs in your production container. So Docker scan and Docker SBOM powered by SNCC and SIFT. But there's an alternative, and that is using the Slim SAS platform. So for container scanning and a visual representation of what's going on in your container, we run this process using um, Trivi and Gripe, and we generate the results of this scanning process. You're also able to just get a, look, a deeper look into the files, the file layers, and also the packages. And what happens is you can see what um, every vulnerability by risk level. And you can also download the SBOMs that are generated if you need them for any type of security compliance. Now that we scanned the container, we want to understand what the, um, the to analyze it to understand what the image size is looking like and what the um, amount of vulnerabilities are in each of the four Python base images that we were just looking at. So one of the ways that you can do that, like I mentioned before, is the Slim Developer Platform. But you can also use our Slim Desktop Docker extension. So this also gives you insight into the file layer system and helps you to understand how you will be optimizing and, uh, your containers and then comparing the changes because we have um, a before and after of the process. You can see how it was, uh, the vulnerability count was reduced and how your image size was also reduced. So now it's time to pick the best base image for your container, for your um, Python Flask app. So here we have the four that we're going to take a look at. We have an, an Alpine uh, Python base image, and that seems to be the smallest here at 48 megabytes. Then we have a distroless one, which is multi-stage build. We have Ubuntu. This one doesn't have Python in it, so we would have to add a command in our Docker file to be able to um, install and use Python. And then the bottom one is the official uh, Python base image, but it's the slimmed version. So one of the things um, we would have to do as it relates to the Ubuntu base image, since it doesn't include Python, like I mentioned before, um, we would have to um, install that. And uh, we can do that using this command. But one of the things to pay attention to is that um, what we want to do is make sure that we're not installing any recommended packages. So this is, will help to keep the image as small as possible. The fewer the packages, the better. So you can use the no install recommends option in order to do that. Um, so that 921 or 23 megabyte Python latest base image I mentioned earlier is a good example of one that's quite large. So of course, as you know, more packages, that makes the container image larger. And the larger it is, then the more it is at risk of uh, increases the attack um, surface. 
And so what you want to do is to, like I mentioned before, install the recommended, do not install the recommended uh, dependencies. And also, um, when, with this example of installing Python 3 without the recommended packages, it actually ends up reducing the package size uh, to by 298 megabytes, I believe. So um, now we can look at building the app and see how the final image sizes compare to each other now that we um, have the Ubuntu one set up. So this is comparing the four Python apps by image size. So now we are showing all of them, and they include um, not only Python, but also the example app and the dependencies, which I think about 11 dependencies. In general, we can believe that smaller is safer. Um, so it still looks like Alpine is winning in this one at 60 megabytes. And also we see that Ubuntu is at 131 megabytes. Um, so Alpine is looking like it's number one that we might want to use for our Flask app. Um, a smaller image size should correspond to fewer packages, so um, that could also result in fewer vulnerabilities. So let's see what the vulnerabilities are looking like. Okay, so Alpine has zero vulnerabilities, which is interesting, and Ubuntu has 24, but it also has no critical or high vulnerabilities, and there's a very specific reason for that. We also see what Distrolist has 47, Three are critical, five are high, and then the official Python base image, the slim version, has 82 vulnerabilities, so it's at the bottom of the list. So um, it looks like Alpine is still a really good choice to use as, our, um, as part of our Flask app. And it's interesting that Ubuntu has 24 vulnerabilities, but none are critical or high. And I think the reason is because we have three medium, I see here, there's also 13 low risk and eight negligible, and so that's how we get to 24. But the reason why it's at zero for critical and high is because it's commercially backed by Linux. And so that full-time security team that they have, they have SLAs to make sure that we never are getting out high or high vulnerabilities or critical vulnerabilities, um, and that's for the supported lifetime of the distro. So um, there is a lot of, there's low complexity when it comes to leveraging the Ubuntu image, and some of the others don't have that. For example, the official Python image that has 82 vulnerabilities is, um, I think, by, run by Debian, which is a community project, and you can't, um, they don't have the same amount of support that Ubuntu would have, so it would make sense that there would be more vulnerabilities here if that's not being managed and um, not being um, attended to. So it, we're thinking about considering Alpine, but also there are some issues. And Python and Node seem to have some issues when it comes to Alpine, and it, for some reason it results in significantly slower builds, and it also introduces some runtime bugs and some strange behavior. So Alpine might be better for a Go or a Rust app. Um, so that's one thing that's a con that we see with this so far. But Alpine was um, going pretty far. It was pretty high on the list so far. But we'll see which one we end up going with. I'm sure some of you all have some uh, have a prediction about which one we'll end up using. But um, So the whole question becomes, what could we do to get the best of both worlds? How can we get the low complexity that comes with Ubuntu because they have so much support to make sure that there are no critical or high vulnerabilities? And how can we get the security profile in the size of Alpine? Alpine is super small and also um, a very low amount of vulnerabilities. And the answer is, is optimizing and harden, harden, hardening your uh, containers. When we slim our containers, then we'll get a better idea of which image will be um, our best case for using that for our Flask app. So we're going to use Slim Toolkit and the Slim Developer platform in order to harden our um, container images. Um, with this command, what basically is going to happen is that we're going to take the image and target the image, and we will then create a temporary container. And there are slim sensors that will be injected into the container, and it will be monitoring everything that is needed in order to run the container by itself. 
you also have to start the container. The observations will happen, and you need to also stop the container so that the sensors understand what's needed to actually stop the container. So then that's going to collect all the artifacts it needs, and then it will build a slim version of the um, container image. And the reason is, is because we don't want to ship code that we don't need. So that is one of the biggest things about slimming containers, is if you don't need certain code, then why not remove it? And that's what Slim does. And of course, the benefits of having a slimmer container is that it's faster to deploy and, of course, fewer files. Um, also, this results in saving costs. Because it is faster, because it's smaller, you'll be able to um, uh, store it and transfer it, and it'll be less expensive. And the big thing here is security. So slim containers reduce the attack surface and the vulnerability count, and especially with unnecessary tools and utilities um, in libraries that get removed, then that results in less vulnerabilities. So now we will compare the Python app by the slimmed image sizes. We did all four, and it looks like Alpine is still at the top with a slimmed uh, size of 19 megabytes, but also Ubuntu is only six megabytes larger than Alpine, which is something pretty interesting. So not too far off from the size of Alpine. And that's something I think that's worth noting here. But in general, all of these um, apps have slimmed and been reduced by like three to seven times. So in general, when you run them through the slimming process, you're going to end up with a smaller image. And now we can see what the vulnerability count looks like for these two top choices. And we see that both of them have a vulnerability count of zero. Um, it looks like the Ubuntu uh, image got rid of the 24 vulnerabilities that it had that were not uh, critical or high, which is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so those three medium risk vulnerabilities were removed. And what you can do is you can look at all of these results in the Slim platform. And you can analyze the difference between the vulnerability diff when before you have hardened your image and um, after you've hardened it. And I think that's a really important information to see how um, the percentage of the reduction in vulnerabilities and also um, how the results of slimming your container to make it more ready for production. Um, so we had the Ubuntu base image that had no known vulnerabilities now, and um, there's a comparable size to the Alpine image. And I think that because of the issues that Alpine has with Python, that and Ubuntu now having zero vulnerabilities, that that might be the actual best case scenario for using that with the Flask app. So let's take a look at what we learned. We learned that there are different techniques to utilize to improve your Docker file when you look at it from a security perspective to reduce the attack surface for your application. Um, we learned that there are scanning and analysis tools that are available to us to review what kind of vulnerabilities that are, we have in our packages and also the risk level of these vulnerabilities. And we're able to make, um, also able to harden these containers and these images to understand how um, we are further reducing the attack surface um, by making these images smaller and by getting rid of or remediating the vulnerabilities. And this also shows that you can slim um, Alpine and Distralist containers. That's a bit more than five, but um, that goes to show you that there's a lot of benefits to thinking about these things from a security perspective um, and normalizing this process of hardening your containers when you want them to be ready for production. And I know I understand that manually hardening things is very tedious and very costly um, and also can and also, it's something that not a lot of people have certain specialization in. And when you have tools like Slim, the platform, the desktop extension to give you further insight into your um, containers, and also this hardening process, then that can really help to mitigate some of the issues that you run into for uh, DevOps and their workflow.
And that is all I have. Um, you can find us at Slim DevOps on Twitter. And we also have a Discord community. And um, we have the Slim Developer platform that you can sign up for and try and play around with either your own private images that you have in your own connector registries or public images that are available on the platform. Um, that's pretty fun to play around with. And you can go through the hardening process and see the vulnerability diffs and all of that. And as well as Slim Toolkit, which is open source. And you can take a look at that on GitHub. And that is all. Yes. <laughs> yes. So in one of your slides, you were um, calling out the process. <laughs> in one of your slides, you were calling out the process of slim build, and one of the sensors looks for a cert, right? So is there a way to turn off that sensor in the case that you might be using a service mesh? Because with the service mesh, you get a sidecar, and that sidecar gets the cert injected instead of actually having the main container have it. So you're saying, is there a way to turn off the sensor? Yeah, or is there a flag that I could just not check for certs so that I can bypass that test and then allow the actual container to build? You know, there might be. So the thing about this Slim Toolkit is very robust, and there might be um, some command options that allow you to do that. Um, one of the things is that I was doing a lot of research on what is actually available, and I was very shocked to see how granular and advanced some of these um, commands are for um, Slim Toolkit. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was available. And some of our um, engineers um, who are deep in the code when it comes to this um, can point that out. And we also do have some documentation that would um, um, bring out some of that, that information. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Oh, he's got it. Thanks. Um, can you mitigate uh, some of the hardening by just running Slim Toolkit? As you, you, you started the presentation by showing, okay, we're um, uh, taking care so that we don't run as root, we're uh, not adding extra packages which are not required, but by just running Slim Toolkit on, for example, the first image that you show in the beginning, can it actually help you to mitigate some of, for example, for people who are not so experimented with, with Docker and don't know how to uh, harden their image uh, can just Slim Toolkit help with that? And just to remove some of the, the problems that... Uh... To remove some of the vulnerabilities. Uh, yeah, that's what the Slim Build command does. So it takes care of all of that with this one command. We also do have um, a Slim CLI, which is slightly different, but uses some of the same tools that were used to build Slim Toolkit. And if you run a few of those commands, it interacts with the developer platform, and that allows you to like, automatically harden your container. So you don't need to be, the point of this is that you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be a DevOps expert in order to do this. Looking at the documentation, you run the commands, and it works. Um, and I think that's a very important thing, because not everyone is um, specialized in this. And it does automatically remove the vulnerabilities, um, and not of course, not every container is, is going to end up with zero um, vulnerabilities, but the purpose is that it's reduced. I hope that answered your question. Um, I think we have a few more minutes, so if there are any other questions, if you probably want to discuss something more or with the crowd. I think or... there's someone back yeah. there. Or... Where? <laughs> Am I missing something? <laughs> okay. No? I, I'm not sure. Just, do you have a question maybe? Okay. <laughs>